Thanks so much, Andrakan. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for coming in. On behalf of the campus, I welcome you to this uh, 25th edition of the Archives Public Lecture Series. Um, it's funny because I guess uh, about five months ago, Pankaj and I, when we sort of met and had a chat about this, we, we had all sorts of plans around the physical exhibition, um, around you know having a week-long sort of conversation on campus and such. And of course, that's not to be. But on the bright side, I guess we also have participants from different parts of the world for this one. So, um, and we, we have the pleasure of uh, Cyrus joining in for this conversation. So I'm, I'm truly grateful to both of them for doing this. Um, I'm just going to do a quick introduction to both of them. Um, and uh, before that, I just wanted to give you a sense of the structure of this conversation. Um, Pankaj will start with an overview of, uh, of the talk, after which Cyrus and Pankaj will have a conversation with each other. Uh, we'll have a Q&A towards the end. And um, at about quarter past five or so, we'll sort of open up the floor, so to speak, and have more people sort of just chat in an informal sort of way. So um, it is my pleasure to, uh, to welcome all of you to this, uh, this talk, um, the lab as a site of a historical excavation. Pankaj um, is an associate professor at the Center for Technology Alternatives for Rural Areas and as an, an associate faculty at the Center for Policy Studies at IIT Bombay. He has a PhD in science and technology studies from Maastricht University, where he worked on the cultures of innovation in nanoscience and technology research in India. His current research interests lie at the intersection of society, science, environment, and technology. He's also a member of the Environmental Action Group, Kalpa Riksh, uh, which has been around since the 1970s. And he's the author of The Last Wave, Islands in Flux, and Nanoscale, Society's Deep Impact on Science, Technology, and Innovation in India, um, which is a book um, which was just published this year. Um, Pankaj's book, Instrumental Lives, by the way, um, is, uh, if people are interested, the, the hard copies are available at Champaga Bookstore in the city, and they're happy to deliver to people who are interested. Uh, Cyrus Modi is a historian of recent science and technology, specifically the applied physical sciences in the United States since 1965. He studies the commercialization of academic research, the long durée of responsible research and innovation, and technopolitics of scarcity in the long 1970s. He's a professor in the History of Science, Technology, and Innovation um, Department, and the chair of the History Department at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. So uh, with that, I will hand it over to Pankaj to lead us through this conversation. Thanks, Pankaj. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I hope I'm audible. And uh, th thanks a lot, Venkat, uh, for this uh, absolutely fascinating opportunity that uh, we have today uh, between me and Cyrus. Uh, so let me thank you and the NCBS, first of all, to uh, kind of have, having organized this talk. Uh, as uh, Venkat mentioned, we've been discussing this for a while, and uh, the initial plan, of course, was for a physical lecture. But in these circumstances, we've had to try this, and uh, it might just be a very interesting experiment. Although we are all also in the middle of an epidemic of webinars that's, that's kind of going on all the time. Sometimes we are guilty, and sometimes we are the victims. Uh, so thanks to, thanks to Venkat uh, in the first place and to the archives at the NCBS, uh, which, is a, which is a very fascinating place. Uh, special thanks also to Cyrus uh, to having joined in. I mean, there are two reasons for that. Uh, one is more personal in the sense that he was on my PhD committee when I defended my PhD in Maastricht in 2016. Uh, so it's absolutely an honor and a privilege to have him back and to have a conversation with him. And the other one, uh, which I'll also mention uh, a little later again, but just to allude to it is the fact that his book of 2011, Instrumental Community, was uh, extremely useful for me when I was doing my PhD work because, uh, and for the book that we are discussing today, Instrumental Lives, uh, the story of making of the first scanning tunneling microscope in India. Uh, so Instrumental Community was also very, very important uh, in that way. So, uh, and thanks to everybody who's joined us today. We have almost 100 participants on Zoom. So I think that that's going to be very exciting. And we look forward uh, to your comment and, and uh, your feedback. So as uh, Venkat mentioned, what I want to do is not take more than 15 or 20 minutes to kind of lay out some of uh, the key points of the story that I want to tell. Uh, it will be in two parts. I will, uh, I will get into those details. Uh, I'm hoping uh, Cyrus will uh, not only respond to what I'm saying, but also share a little bit of his own work uh, in the context of the specific domain of nanotechnology and uh, the, the scanning probe microscope that we're talking about. But uh, also the idea that is the theme of the, of the discussion today, uh, the lab as a site of a historical excavation, and, and then we'll open it up for, for discussion. 
so let me uh, start by uh, sharing my screen with the powerpoint and we will go on uh, from there so i hope the the screen is visible now uh, yeah uh, cyrus can you see the screen yeah so uh, you know i just uh, i don't know who did this invite although it's about the talk we are giving but i want to thank venkat and the designer who's done this i mean it's absolutely fantastic in the context of the talk we want to give and if some of you have not seen this invite uh, i would urge you to look at it at leisure uh, because the very thin print the very fine print at the bottom of excavation reads and i'll read it out in 1989 ibm scientists used a scanning tunneling microscope to spell the letters ibm by arranging 35 xenon atoms on a nickel crystal the design font above resembles the ibm lettering i think it's absolutely beautiful to set up uh, the conversation that we've had and i will come back to this uh, set of uh, this image that uh, uh, the archives at ncbs has put out for us uh, how it played out in, in in the sense in in real terms of uh, the story of the scanning tunneling microscope and Uh, the story that we're going to talk about. Uh, the talk today is uh, is going to be in some senses about uh, this this new book that I did recently, published about a year ago in Europe and the US, and we just had the India edition a few months ago here in India. This is uh, Instrumental Lives, uh, an intimate biography of an Indian laboratory. This is the story uh, of a particular laboratory. Uh, which has a very interesting history uh, in the University of Pune, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think Professor Dharmadikari, who headed that research group, has also joined us uh, on the Zoom. And uh, a number of his students who were in the lab and who appear in the book are also with us on Zoom. So uh, I'm hoping we'll also get to hear from them. So I want to uh, to illustrate the, the the topic of the lab as a site of a historical investigation or excavation. I want to tell you the story of what instrumental lives is. Uh, it's a i think it's a very fascinating story at multiple registers uh, i won't have the time to go into all those details but i'll flag some of the things that i find very interesting uh, there are the various dimensions that one can enter into uh, through a story of this kind and i'm saying a story of this kind because not just because it is this story but the hope is that there'll be more stories of labs that will be told so that is going to be first part of the uh, talk that i'm going to do today the second part will be uh, will will actually deal with the thematic dimension of what we are discussing today and i will lay out some of my thoughts and ideas of what it means really for uh, the lab to be the site of a historical uh, excavation uh, it's not something i have thought about much and i think uh, fibers might be better placed but i do have a few uh, markers and pointers to kind of uh, to, to 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 share with you in terms of what i think might be uh, interesting things to look at so uh, so there is instrumental lives of course that i just mentioned but uh, also coming out instrumental lives came out of my phd work like i mentioned and like venkat mentioned from from maastricht from maastricht university more recently i have also actually just uh, two weeks ago we published this new book which is a non academic account of stories from the laboratory that came out of my phd and this story that we are discussing in detail today is very much part of it but this is a story of four laboratories nano science and nano technology laboratory that i studied in my phd and i will also briefly touch upon what this book does because it kind of contextualizes the larger story of what instrumental lives is and uh, i just also want to you know show up because i mean that that is the uh, the body of work that perhaps we will Uh, draw upon between me and and Cyrus. These are two of Cyrus's most recent books, and I think he's working on a new edited collection now, or probably has just done one. On the left hand side is the book I mentioned, Instrumental Community, a probe microscopy and the path to nanotechnology. Uh, is the book that I read three times when I was doing my PhD. I draw upon it immensely, both uh, for the methodological dimensions, but also some very very interesting information. And the second book which I have not read is the Long Arm of Moore's Law. microelectronics and american science and and maybe cyrus you can tell us a little bit about uh, these books but i thought i laid out that this is the four the four sets of material that we will kind of also be talking about today um uh, so quickly if i jump into the work that this this book is about in a sense uh enculturing innovation at the bottom indian engagements with nanotechnology was 
the kind of working title of my thesis. Uh, uh, these were using uh, methods in sociology and history and anthropology to study the scientific establishment and the scientific laboratory. So, uh, which I think in the Indian context is a relatively new uh, method of doing investigation. I think a lot of the people who have joined us today on the seminar perhaps are already aware of that. It might be interesting and new for a lot of other people. Uh, but to just to lay the context of uh, what this work draws upon that I'm presenting today, these were studies, importantly, of the mainstream of Indian science and technology. So it's important to mention the mainstream because some of the things that emerge uh, and which I will uh, probably allude to or talk about, we don't normally associate in the Indian context with the mainstream. These are normally with the peripheries or with the marginals or with the even the vulnerable. So ideas of innovation uh, that are normally you know, relegated to the margins and to the, to the non-centers, non to the peripheries, are very central in the story. Because what I was doing in my PhD was, of course, looking at what labs are doing. But the frame was to look at whether we can see if innovation happens in a particularly culturally or, or, or socially or economically uh, contextualized kind of context. So that's an important thing to flag, uh, flag here. Uh, the methods used were very qualitative uh, in, 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 the, in, in the way it was done. There was uh, qualitative inter interviewing that I did with about 100 scientists uh, during the course of my study. There's a considerable amount of historical analysis where today's uh, talk becomes interesting. And of course, there is uh, the method of ethnographies in the laboratory where uh, we spend a lot of time in laboratories, observing scientists, talking to them, uh, seeing how the spaces are organized, et cetera. What emerges very broadly, and I'll just quickly run through is, uh, in the Indian context, there's a diversity of sources, resources, people, ideas, materials, instruments, and knowledge systems that scientists, even in the mainstream, are actually mobilizing as they go about their work. And this might seem a little too abstract now, but for this, one would need to go into greater detail. And I'm hoping uh, people will be able to read some of the stuff that people like me and Cyrus are writing to be able to make sense of that. I also make the claim that diversities actually in the Indian con context, um, not only do they exist, they can be an asset. Uh, it's a normative claim I want to make and also that we should be drawing upon that diversity as an asset, uh, both for science and technology, but also for science and technology for development and human well-being. And then there is the larger idea of innovation where, uh, again, uh, I, I would like to challenge the kind of mainstream notions of innovation, which I think continue to be very Schumpeterian in that sense, even today, when there's a lot more that is happening. And I'm also trying to address some of those questions uh, through my research work, but also specifically through instrumental lives. Uh, the four labs that I actually studied, uh, the first one on the left hand is the STM story, which I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, and just to very quickly, uh, uh, the, the second lab was a lab, again, in Pune that uh, did work at the interface of modern uh, modern science and Ayurveda. The third one, which says water filters, is the story of one water filter, nano silver enabled water filter that was developed in the city of Hyderabad and has a very interesting story. And the fourth one is where uh, a bunch of nano scientists and doctors are trying to develop a protocol based on uh, nanotechnology to, to treat a condition of the eye of little children uh, known as retinoblastoma. So it is within this larger set of four case studies and four framings that I will come to uh, instrumental life and the story of this particular laboratory. So in some senses, the story of instrumental lives and, and, and the, the, the particular empirical example of historical excavation in a laboratory uh, is of the scanning tunneling microscope. This is a picture, uh, I, I, if I understand right, a, a model of among the earliest scanning tunneling microscopes made at uh, IBM in Zurich. And maybe uh, Cyrus could confirm, and I think Professor Dharmadikari also, uh, I got the picture from him if I remember right. So very quickly, uh, if I was to give a very short, quick snapshot history of the STM, is that uh, in 1970s, late 70s, early 80s instrument uh, that helped us uh, or scientists visualize uh, life and matter at the, at the nanoscale. Uh, it's a non-optical microscope where a sharp, uh, sharp pointed edge is moved over a surface. Uh, the tunneling of the electron then helps mapping the current and then in some ways mapping the surface. It is credited with having span, uh, spawned nanoscience and nanotechnology. And that becomes particularly important because in the field of science and technology research itself and 
then on the corporate side of it, it is now a multi-million dollar kind of industry and an enterprise. And in some senses, and I think uh, not everybody agrees with that. And I think uh, uh, Cyrus's book, uh, Instrumental Community, is actually a very nuanced refutation of that claim uh, from, a, from, a, from a constructive perspective of how nanotechnology came about, but not necessarily only because of DSTM. But, uh, but for all practical purposes, that, that is what it is. Now, this story in the 1980s uh, is how uh, nanotechnology, in a sense, begins. And the story that I stumbled upon when I began my PhD research was the story of the late 80s and early 90s uh, in this laboratory in Pune University uh, that started to make not similar looking instruments, but uh, scanning tunneling microscopes and scanning probe microscopes that performed very similar functions in ways that were very interestingly done in the laboratory. And I, I'm, I'm going to come to some of that part. But here is the other picture that I wanted to allude to uh, when I said in the very beginning. On the left-hand side, you see that uh, the image that IBM created, uh, these are different versions of that. And you know, it's a very interesting uh, set of images that get mobilized because what you see on the right-hand side, and I will, uh, uh, I just allude to this. This is among the first images I was shown when I went to this laboratory in Pune University, uh, the laboratory that the story is about. And, uh, and this is a uh, 200 angstrom by 200 angstrom and 250 angstrom by 250 angstrom images of ohm on the top and of the STM at the bottom uh, on the gold surface that uh, scientists in this particular laboratory uh, actually created. So how, uh, how the uh, creation of a particular image uh, solidifies a certain idea of what that scientific discipline is or what it means. It shows very nicely in the instrument, uh, in the images on the left hand side. It's a very iconic image that also created a huge amount of interest in the public and in mobilizing of support and resources. And you have a similar thing happening here uh, in the Pune laboratory. Among my first, uh, so uh, when I approached uh, Professor Dharmarikari first, and I am already seeing I'm going to be short on time, so I'm going to wrap up a little faster is uh, uh, when I, I got access to him in a, in a very interesting way. Uh, you know, for an STSR, a person who's doing a study of the laboratory, getting access is one of the biggest challenges. Uh, as an ethnographer, why would a scientist allow you access into the laboratory? Why should a scientist trust a sociologist or an ethnographer? Why should they give you access to their intellectual property, to their physical space? All these are very serious questions, always in sociological research, but also more so in, in the research of this kind because uh, of course there, there's a power dynamic as well. Uh, but I was lucky to get access to uh, Professor Dharmadikari's lab. Uh, there are interesting reasons I, I speculate why that might have happened. I have mentioned that in the book uh, and I've never spoken to Professor Dharmadikari about that, but I don't know what he thinks about my speculations. Uh, but uh, I, I got access to him. He was very excited about uh, uh, my research project. He found it very intriguing and interesting. And that I'm sure is part of the reason why he allowed me to get in there. Among my, my earliest memories of uh, going into the lab was to see this refrigerator uh, and this tripod inside. And the story that kind of comes out of that I thought was very, very fascinating. And it, in some senses, is, a, is at the heart of that culture of innovation uh, that I'm talking about and that the book eventually is, is that this tripod actually housed or supported a uh, scanning tunneling microscope inside. And, the refrigerator was just basically being used as a low cost uh, vibration and sound isolation device. And there are multiple examples of this, what I eventually call uh, the reconfiguring of materiality, uh, probably driven by a constraint of resources that uh, even, even uh, scientists in the mainstream of Indian science and technology have. So we are not even talking about small town or, or small university laboratories, but in, in, a big, in a big city of Pune, in a prominent university like Pune University, uh, a, a prominent scientist uh, has a, a resource constraint. And how this is uh, used in a sense to mobilize ideas and resources, et cetera, et cetera. I think this, is, uh, this, this was a very excellent example of that. And there are a number of examples that uh, I saw in this laboratory. Perhaps I didn't uh, capture all of them. And I would argue these are also visible in, in laboratories in other parts of the country where these kinds of resources are, are not very easily available. Here is another example uh, in the same laboratory. Here you see in the inflated tube of a car tire on which there are multiple heavy sheets of metal and then uh, other sheets of metal separated by Vuitton rubber tubing. 
creating multiple levels of vibration isolation. Again, a low cost uh, device that serves the purpose, uh, that does uh, good science, uh, et cetera. Uh, I, I'm just giving you two or three examples because uh, this reconfiguring of materiality in some senses in various ways, I find to be at the heart of uh, this culture of innovation that we see not just outside the laboratory, but one can argue uh, at the heart of modern scientific research and innovation in the Indian context today. Similarly, this is uh, among the uh, one of the instruments that was among developed among the, the most uh, newest or the latest or the last student uh, who was doing his PhD in, uh, in this laboratory. Uh, this was part of a uh, paper that then appeared in the current science in 2013. And what you see in this uh, picture is, uh, and you can see the scale, this is a tuning fork bought, if I remember right, for a few rupees uh, from a quartz watch repairer outside Pune University. And it was used here for a combined STM AFM kind of setup. And you can see the uh, uh, setup here and, and, and the use of the materials in, in, a, in a kind of limited kind of sense. So uh, because there's a shortage of time, the thing here is, uh, is this, that uh, what seems to be a uh, suboptimal way of doing or maybe creating instruments. Uh, and this is the reaction that one does get when one talks of this kind of uh, work. I, I might just give a little example here. In the middle of our PhD, we had a workshop in, in Kenya. And uh, we were talking to a whole bunch of Kenyan nanoscientists, uh, my supervisor, uh, Weber Biker, also from our university, my other colleagues. And I presented this case study of innovation and uh, doing high class research and high quality research. And it was very interesting to see the response of the uh, Kenyan scientists. Their first reaction was, no, this is not possible. Uh, this kind of uh, reconstructing of materials and using of materials cannot deliver high quality science in this kind of way. Then the example went to say, is it not dangerous? Uh, one of the scientists said, uh, you know, young people in my village actually might make guns using this kind of thing. And then, uh, you know, the, the key scientist said, but we also have a lot of uh, innovation happening with a local context uh, with this kind of methodology, even in, in rural Kenya. And suddenly the scientists realized that there might be a, a breakthrough for them in the sense that it can actually be possible. So uh, the first reaction seems to be it cannot be done. But if you look at the history, and I'm, I'm really closing down already a uh, presentation that I'm making. If you look at what this, this particular laboratory actually delivered is, uh, uh, I don't have an exact uh, fix on the numbers, but maybe 70, 80 papers that came out of these instruments, the making of the instruments, the experiments done with the instruments that was at the cutting edge of modern science and technology. They published papers in leading peer reviewed journals across, across the scientific community. Many of the PhD students who uh, today actually have also joined us, I think, came out of this laboratory. Uh, they were accepted uh, as postdocs in leading institutions across the globe. Uh, so certainly there was, there was something that was happening. And I think a very important dimension which gets missed out uh, is the training of the scientists that was achieved in the laboratory enterprise of this kind. Because uh, so, you know, the, the interesting critique that I got repeatedly, and I, I guess the scientists would have also got, is that if this was such an interesting and a good method of doing science and developing instruments, why didn't this scientific group actually commercialize their instruments? You know, it was amazing that across the board, across two years, three years of talking about this, my own learnings of this particular laboratory, this seemed to be almost like a unanimous concern that everybody had about the laboratory. And I found that very problematic on multiple grounds because uh, we can discuss that. But I just want to refer to this last point that I make in this slide is that the training in scientific instrument and in science and in, in instrumental lives, and I, I will read out uh, uh, two brief quotes. People in scientific administration and heading scientific institutions across the globe, and I think this is well documented now, leading administrators, one of the biggest concerns that they all have today is of trained human capacity. So that resources are available, uh, uh, instruments are available, money is available, but do we have enough trained human resource to be able to do justice to these particular instruments? And I, uh, maybe for shortage, because of shortage of time, I won't read, but I, I quote two science administrators. One is uh, Professor Balram, who was former director IISC and editor in current science. In multiple editorials, 
in the current science in 2010, 11, 12, 13, he writes exactly in, in, in these words saying that the capacities that we have are not commensurate with, uh, commensurate with the resources that we're putting into getting uh, instruments. And the other one that I refer to is Professor B Piston, who writes in Nature as a matter of fact, and talks about a global problem. So they're saying repeatedly that uh, the money is there, but the instruments are only go as good as the human capacity that we build up. And it's clearly uh, that that's a big problem. And I think people like Dharmadikari and others would also uh, attest to the fact that that is. So I think it's very important to keep in mind what was the purpose of that scientific enterprise and to evaluate it by commercial terms alone and ask for its commercialization, et cetera, et cetera. I think uh, there is a problem there. I, I go on and because this was, uh, I mean, this is a very interesting, very contentious, uh, we can go on and on discussing about this, but uh, uh, instrumental lives uh, and my thesis, I talk about a culture of innovation, which I call technical technological jugaad, which is based a lot on the case study of this particular laboratory, but also extended references to a whole body of literature, which is there in the book. It's a, a eight point, and I'll quickly run through these points. We, we'll discuss them if you have the time. Uh, which constitute this technological jugaad. And I saw this across the board. I saw this in a scientific laboratory. You also see it in a poor urban slum. You also see it in rural India. So it is a kind of an over, uh, overcompassing or encompassing culture of innovation, if I might argue, argue so. Reconfiguring of materiality, bridging ways of knowing, bridging ways of knowledge systems, problem solving, which all innovation is about. This particular kind of technological innovation or innovation is driven by resource constraints. It deals in a very interesting space of the materials and conceptual commons. There is a liminality where the legality is concerned. In some cases, there are objects that are jugaad, which are illegal by, by Indian law. I also feel that in the first instance, these are not intended for commercialization. That's an important keep, uh, thing to keep in mind. Also, when we evaluate these enterprises, and there is a culture of recycling that is involved. Uh, this is some of the other larger context of the book where the geography of the place, this is the contents of this particular book, where the geography of the laboratory, uh, the people who are in the laboratory, uh, the, the eco enabling ecosystem of the city of Pune and the suburbs, how that makes a certain enterprise important. So the locality uh, uh, as, as also the universality, I think simultaneously become important. Just a, a kind of glimpse of, uh, you can see on the right hand side, uh, and I think that's, that's what makes the laboratory ethnography interesting from a historical point of view. I'll come to that. Uh, just some images of this particular laboratory. And the image on the right-hand side bottom uh, is an image also of the laboratory, but uh, I, I would guess, if I leave it open, you would guess uh, what it means to see the doors of the laboratory pulled apart. So an enterprise that started in the 80s, and if I might just say so, uh, it does not exist anymore. And I think that itself is a very, very interesting question of what happened to that laboratory? Why does it not exist anymore? I deal with it in the book. I have my own questions. I have my own thoughts about it. And we can discuss it uh, a little later. Let me come to the last slide and I will, I will finish here. Uh, if I look at this work, what do we mean? And I'm sorry about this error that is there in the title that is as the site and not as the site of historical ex excavation. Actually, we were trying to put it at the center, not at the site. So that's more than a Freudian slip. So I think uh, the lab of the present, uh, when an ethnographer enters, is a live and it's a multi-dimensional archive. That's what I want to put across. Because a, a, a classical archive is looked at as a repository of paper. And I might argue that a live laboratory that one enters has people, has paper, and has materials, has objects. And objects have their histories. Each of these, the paper that is there, you know, that receipt that I showed you in the earlier picture, a photograph that might be there, a calendar on the wall, or a poster of a scientific uh, conference that is put up, are all objects that are uh, narratives of the present, but also narratives of the past. Looking at that tells us a lot about what the past might be. So when I enter a laboratory as an ethnographer, not only do I tell the story of the lab of the present, I'm also telling simultaneously the story of the past, of the history of that lab and its people. Uh, that, so that's point number two. Point number three, uh, see the lab is, uh, and uh, if you have time, maybe uh, Cyrus could also speak a little bit about that. And we all know it, that the laboratory in a sense is the centerpiece of the modern s &T enterprise. 
and the ethnographic study of a lab can tell us a lot about the different institutions that the lab is part of. So perhaps we will know more about ISNT policies or we'll know different things about ISNT policies and establishment only when we enter the lab, which we will not be aware of or which we will not even engage with uh, through policy documents or uh, through scientific publications or whatever. So the lab is an operationalization and also the embodiment of an idea of science, technology and innovation. And this, a lot of it may not be there in texts, in policies, even in publications that come out from these laboratories, even the products that come out from these laboratories. And, uh, and if I might just take a leap a little bit and say that an account of the lab that I say, uh, uh, talk about today actually becomes the history for tomorrow. So if I have an account of a laboratory that I'm talking in today's terms, the historian of tomorrow will be able to use this uh, material. And I say this particularly so because in the context of Indian laboratories of which we have thousands, I really don't know how many stories we have of laboratories from India. And these can be fascinating stories for themselves, but like I'm hoping instrumental lies and other studies that are happening will, will, will point out. And I'm hoping I'm able to convince uh, people who joined us that these stories are fascinating by themselves. They operate at multiple levels and I really can't do justice to uh, that, that multiplicity and that fascinating story of each of these laboratories. But I will end here. Uh, thank you very much. I've taken more than I had intended to take, but uh, Cyrus, uh, if you could uh, step in, uh, respond, and, and I, I'm very keen myself to, to listen to you, and I'm going to mute myself if that's possible. I'll, of course, stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Pankaj uh, and Venkat and NCBS uh, for the invitation to join you today. And uh, thank you, Pankaj, for this uh, incredible study. It's really, uh, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful book. Um, you very kindly alluded to instrumental community and invited me to say a few words about how that uh, book fits with yours. Yeah, I'd like to draw out some of the ways that um, our two studies are complementary and, and build on each other. Um, and also, yeah, then to approach this question of the, the lab as a site of historical uh, excavation. Uh, so my book um, is started like yours as an anthropological study uh, of a material science laboratory. So going into the lab, uh, talking with the people there, uh, sitting beside them as they worked, um, taking pictures, um, yeah, just trying to understand the laboratory as a, as a place of social practice, uh, but also material practice. Uh, and what really struck me when I first went into the lab in, in this mode is that the laboratory is made up of this very heterogeneous collection of tools and people and ideas and materials and so forth. Uh, you alluded to this as well as this diversity that we really uh, should cherish uh, in the laboratory. I was particularly interested in the ways in which Material scientists work with all of these different tools, some of which have a very long history, so things like glassware, uh, some of which have a kind of middle range history, things like electron microscopes, which are you know, almost a century old. Uh, the lab I was in, they were also working with a very new, at that point, uh, instrument called the atomic force microscope. It was uh, not much more than 10 years old uh, at the time that I uh, started working with these people. And I really became fascinated by the ways in which, in the laboratory, the challenge is to make these different tools work with each other, to coordinate together, and to try to produce robust knowledge from that coordination of, of these different objects that have very different histories. Um, so th that's the way in which I think of the lab as a site of historical excavation, is that there are all of these different things embedded in the laboratory, and we could take each of them out, we could excavate them and trace them back and think about their histories, how they got into that laboratory, what they carry with them on that path into the laboratory, but then also how they interact in the present. So the instrumental community really was an attempt to do that for this one object, the, the atomic force microscope, and then uh, also the scanning tunneling microscope since the, the AFM is descended from uh, the STM. Uh, so that meant um, becoming going into a little bit more of an historical mode and going outside of this one laboratory where I started and, and traveling around the United States, around Europe, interviewing people who'd been involved with STM and AFM early on and trying to understand how a community developed around these instruments 
that made it possible for those instruments then to go into uh, laboratories uh, all over the world. So what you're study is really um, this beautifully textured study of a single site. The rest of the world yeah, interacts with that site, but you really are trying to show how people in this one site worked. My study is much more a superficial look at many different sites. Uh, and we, we need both. The two perspectives really are, are complementary. We need to understand in a very detailed way how people in particular sites work, but we also need to understand how those sites are connected to lots of sites uh, all over the world. Uh, so, yeah, the upshot of this is that, uh, you know, I've been um, involved in uh, thinking about the, the history and um, the social practice of uh, STM for a very long time, 20 years now. Um, I also have a personal connection to Pune, as you know, my father uh, was from there. And so when I found that you were doing this study of STM in Pune, uh, really that uh, spoke to my heart. I was uh, really delighted. And then to, when I actually read your study and found that it was really such a, a well done a piece of research that really was very, very gratifying. Uh, so I, I'm very pleased that uh, you are a graduate of uh, Maastricht University and that uh, we can continue uh, to work together uh, in, in forums like this. So let, let's open it up to questions a little bit. Uh, I've said a little bit about my story. I think maybe we can just start, this is a little trick as an interviewer to, to make things biographical. So maybe we could start a little bit with your uh, story. So how did you come to be doing um, a PhD in STS uh, and a PhD on nanoscience uh, in India? Yeah, and you need to unmute. <laughs> yes, sorry, yes. Uh, I think one of the most uh, evocative uh, methods and uh, possibilities, and I think which we keep using in STS, and I would, that is serendipity. So it was completely unplanned. I was, uh, uh, I, I did a PhD relatively late uh, in life in that sense. So uh, I think, I think I, I have now become a very, very strong proponent of late life PhDs. Because I think, particularly in the, uh, in, in the humanities and social sciences, because I think the experience of going out and working uh, brings a huge amount to uh, this, these disciplines. And at the same time, getting into a PhD really helps understand, contextualize, mobilize the experience and the learning that we might have had. Uh, and, and I also been saying that if there's an opportunity, please do a PhD in a field completely unrelated to what you've been doing for the last 15 years. <laughs> it's, a, it's a difficult uh, possibility, but I was lucky because I got that. I've been working in the field of, uh, the, of the environment, of activism as an environmentalist, of, of writing about these things. And it was quite by chance through, in a sense, uh, networks that uh, I, I came across Weber, Weber Biker, my supervisor, mm. and uh, uh, I mean, I'm a fantastic person to work with. Uh, he was quite by chance looking for a PhD candidate for a project that he was already working on. It was a project uh, funded by the Dutch Research Council, uh, looking at nanotechnology across the globe. So it was a multi, uh, multi-continent project. Uh, there were going to be PhD students in India, in Europe, and in Africa. And in a sense, he was looking for a, for a PhD candidate. And I happened to be at the right place at the right time. And really, I mean, it's just, just about that. And I think uh, in a sense, uh, maybe the Dutch system is a lot more flexible and a lot more open and perhaps also more resources uh, that I could very easily uh, uh, come onto the program. So in that sense, I think there was a huge, huge credit to Weber for having taken the risk, for having given me this opportunity. And uh, for me personally, I was in a, in a space at that point of time where I was looking to do something different from what I was doing. Uh, I was in a comfort zone and in a sense becoming a, a aware of the fact that I, I could take the risk of stepping out of that comfort zone. Uh, and uh, this opportunity came my way and, uh, and, and, and thankfully it's really worked out. I've, I've learned a lot. Uh, it's been a very fascinating journey and it opened up very many uh, windows and doors uh, for me. Yeah. Yeah, serendipity and, but not just serendipity, the, the, the willingness to, to act on serendipity uh, really is incredibly important in science. You see it in many, many of the, the yeah. early uh, people in STM and AFM that they 
a chance conversation in the hallway or they read, you know, a short little uh, notice in a newspaper and then they thought, oh, yeah, that's that's what I want to do with the rest of my career is to follow that, um, uh, including, I think, uh, Dama Dekai. So can you say a little more about um, about his story, how he how he came to surface science? This is kind of an unusual specialty. It's not a large community. Uh, and then, yeah, what drove him to pick up STM? What what uh, compelled him? So um, the story that I know, and and maybe uh, Dharmadikar himself could tell us that story today, or maybe at, in in some other platform in larger detail. Uh, again, I think serendipity plays a role there because when the first uh, STM conference was happening in Spain, and I narrate that story uh, in the book as as obviously narrated to me by him, he happened to be again, at that time, at that space, in that moment, in Spain, on another kind of, uh, say, scientific expedition or, or, or exploration. And uh, uh, if I remember right, in the interview that he gave me, he said he decided to take a detour. And the detour led him to uh, this meeting. And he found some maybe kindred souls. And he found an association. That's what he says. And I think he, he in some senses, uh, felt there was something out there that uh, was there for the, for the doing. And uh, then again, he had the opportunity of traveling a bit in the 80s. And I think uh, in that sense, uh, there is that element of uh, having that opportunity to travel uh, in, in, in the India of those times. I think it was not very easy to go abroad. Uh, foreign, foreign currency resource, uh, foreign exchange uh, concerns and permissions and travel and all that may not have been as easy as it is today, of course. So. He was there and then he was able to attend the next STM conference as well. He stuck up conversations with scientists, the leading scientists across on both sides of the, in, in, in Europe and in, in the US. And so I think it's a combination of somewhere. And I think he also was interested in, in instrumentation in that sense that might have been. And I think the link to surface science, to instrumentation, to seeing the linkages and the possibilities perhaps of what this offered and things working out for him in terms of networks and him coming back and doing these kind of interesting things uh, that he did. And maybe retrospectively, one might say that, well, he was convinced of what he was doing and that well might be true. I'm not in any way uh, disputing that. So, I mean, that is really the snapshot of the story. Uh, I think uh, uh, among the other things that uh, there, there were particular ways in which he did his science. Now, uh, it, it could be the story of this individual or this laboratory, but uh, I think that also may have contributed maybe some kinds of people can do some kinds of things better. And maybe it was a right kind of match. Uh, so I think uh, willing to experiment, uh, which I think is absolutely fundamental for scientific work, uh, but in a way that uh, may not have, was larger than just the laboratory. Because to go out and get resources from what might be you know, the unexpected spaces, uh, and there are many examples of that that I do narrate in the book. I think that, that made it very interesting and also uh, getting the help of uh, small scale industries in Pune, like he mentioned, like I mentioned, uh, the, of course, interacting with other scientists and scientific institutions. So all of this kind of, you know, this, this issue of place and space that uh, I think in, in STS, we keep reiterating that these are very important. The individual, uh, the discipline is important, but the context in which people are located, uh, I think are uh, extremely important, which we don't seem to recognize. And uh, I think this story really, bears that out very, very well in my understanding. Yeah. Uh, you know, one way in which place and space really matters is uh, the physical movement of, of people around the world. Uh, so you talk about uh, Damodikai going to these conferences, visiting people's laboratories. Um, you, you know, the, the STM was invented at this IBM laboratory uh, outside Zurich. And one of the people I interviewed said, well, you know, in the early days, everyone made this pilgrimage to Zurich. They all went there. They had to see how the original one worked in order to go home and, and make their own. Um, and you you talk in the book about yeah, Dr. Dekai traveling. You talk about his uh, students you know, going all over the world to become postdocs, uh, some of them then returning to India. You also make a, a passing reference to a student from the Middle East working in his laboratory. That's the person who left behind this, the famous refrigerator that you showed us. Can you say a little bit about the kind of, yeah, yeah, uh, channels of circulation that uh, this lab in Pune was connected to. 
I mean, I think that's a damn good question, but I don't have the answer to that because it's not something I, I looked at while I was working and also also subsequently. Uh, I, it'll, it'll be something that I, I, I would really need to look at as to uh, the students who pass through. I, I think it would make a very interesting study itself of their profiles, their backgrounds, where they went uh, and, and where they went after that. Uh, some came back, but some, I mean, there is uh, there's one person I know who's become a good friend uh, Rajendra Shirsagar, who's also joined us, uh, he's moved out of science completely. He does science communication, he does some interesting writing, he has his own very strong perspective on science and technology. He was among the earliest uh, PhD students under Dharmadikari. So uh, this, this idea of the movement and the circulation, I think, uh, will be very fascinating. And just uh, in a different context, the other lab that I worked in actually had 20 PhD students uh, that were doing their PhD at that point of time. And even, even four or five years later, when I look back, it's absolutely fascinating where that that cohort of uh, students have gone. Some yeah. have gone into, into becoming entrepreneurs, uh, into startups. Some have gone abroad in the conventional trajectory. Uh, so I think uh, this, this, these are very interesting opportunities that open up uh, when we enter the laboratory. So in, in this particular case, I don't know that story fully, but it'd be a fascinating one to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's another example of the kind of diversity in science that, that you said that we should cherish, right? That um, there's not one scientific career. There are many, many different ways of making a life where mm. at some point in that life you, you touch science, you, you enter the laboratory, but where that goes from there um, can take many different, uh, different forms. Yes. I wonder if this um, question about circulation also relates to the points about uh, Dugad that you make uh, in yeah. the book. Right? So yeah. as we've discussed, uh, some of the things that were happening uh, in this lab in Pune, you also saw similar things um, in other uh, places in the world. So in labs in California, people were making STMs and AFMs, um, you know, putting their STM in, in a coffee can instead of in a refrigerator. And uh, you write about all of that in Instrumental yeah, Community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. People uh, were using headstones, uh, you know, putting their microscopes on, on, on gravestones uh, as a way to uh, shield them from vibrations. They were, um, they were going to uh, pawn shops and buying diamonds and crushing them to, to make little tips. Yeah, this, so many of the same things that you see um, in your book, in, in Pune, we can see something possibly similar in other places. But I, I thought, could you comment a little on, on where the similarities come up from? Were people talking about these things? But also, how similar are these different practices? So one point you want to make is that Jugad comes out of a, a necessity to do these things for survival. Does that make a, a, a real distinction between um, going to the bazaar in Pune and going to the pawn shop in, in Santa Barbara? So, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think that's a very interesting and an important question. And I don't know why people in Santa Barbara go to the pawn shop because I mean, that, you, you might be able to, uh, the specific reason. But what I feel uh, is that uh, I, I, uh, if I was to kind of zoom out a little bit, and again, I discussed this in the book, you know, if you look at different languages, if you look at different cultures, if you look at different geographies, almost un uh, uniformly, different cultures and geographies and languages have similar processes and terminologies. So bricolage in the French, I mean, comes from a very different context, but if you look at some, and uh, there's some writing in that sense in bricolage, it really maps onto, a, uh, on many registers, maps onto Jugad and, and the Jugadu, the person who does Jugad. And as a matter of fact, I, again, I, 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 I read about it somewhere and I referred to it somewhere is that in the Indian context, you know, there are uh, scholars who, who write in Hindi, write about uh, innovation as Jugard or, 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 or writing about Jugard. And in the abstract, which might be an English abstract, they translate Jugard as bricolage, not as innovation. Yep. So, you know, the connections are very interesting. So in Kenya, in, in, and again, I'm not so, I, I'm not a linguist or I don't have so much of knowledge, but Juakali uh, in, in, in Swahili refers to a very similar kind of context in the local language and local geography where resource constraint, poor people looking to find solutions to problems that they're facing. So, uh, so what I'm trying to say is that uh, perhaps uh, there is a narrative of innovation 
that is, uh, for want of a better framing or very Schumpeterian, that has become very domineering, uh, which has continued to be domineering, which is about the enterprise, which is about the entrepreneur, which is about the firm, which is about making money, which continues to kind of proliferate. When you realize that in the Indian context, 85, 90% of the economy is in the informal sector. So I was just thinking earlier today, you know, the, the, the politics of innovation research or the politics of innovation economics is about the formal sector. What about the informal sector, which most of India is in? So uh, Jugad is, a, is, is an interesting, is a very, very interesting concept. And you can actually just go on and on about it because it has so many multiple dimensions that play out with it. Uh, it, it, there is a huge negative baggage to Jugad, which really makes the conversation very interesting and problematic. And now there's an increasing uh, uh, um, support of Jugad, particularly in management literature, which is also very problematic. Uh, so my, my, my contention and my plea really is for a more rigorous engagement with the concept of Jugad. You know, we are we're very loose, and I keep talking about it in what I've been writing. Uh, scholars and otherwise have been very loose in the way we use that terminology. So my effort in a very limited context has been to say, okay, let's broadly agree about, then we will also evaluate what is being done in that framework. So, you know, it's like you, you are actually saying, I'm going to do this, but you suddenly come around and start evaluating it by some other parameters. It's unfair on that, on what is being done. So if, for instance, I mean, in this case, well, it's not a Jagad relation, but if a scientist is saying, I'm doing science, to teach students and to do good quality science, then how fair is it to ask, what is the commercial viability? I have never claimed commercial viability, for instance. So I think uh, this kind of engagement uh, is what is very, very essential. And my informal conversations now with scientists, you know, in, in other institutions, in IIT where I am and otherwise, and, and like you've been saying, these kinds of practices are not at all uncommon in laboratories, whether in rich countries or in poor countries. And it might only be expected because it's such a broad and new field of research that nobody really has anything for you. You have to create anything that you do from the very scratch. So actually, uh, Eric Von Hippel's work in the 80s of, of evaluation of economics, so of scientific research and, and uh, innovation from economic lenses actually says in his work that he did over four family of instruments, modern instruments, that 90% of the primary innovation is done by the scientists themselves. And we can call it something. I mean, we don't have to call it Jagad, but it just seems absolutely appropriate in the Indian context. I mean, I had a reviewer of this book uh, who did a very interesting review uh, in the front line very recently. And he, I mean, says uh, Jugard was actually a distraction to the, what the story of the book was. And I, I thought uh, that's what makes it interesting because we are now relocating it in the Indian context. Uh, there might be problems with the articulation, but I think there is work to be done there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, well, I think it's one of the most intriguing parts of the, of the study. So I, yeah, I, I'm glad you went with it and didn't uh, listen to voices that tried to distract you. Um, yeah, maybe one last question before we go to the, the Q&A. So um, I, I fully agree with um, the aim of critiquing this um, dominant understanding of innovation and trying to think about you know what's missing from that. Um, and one thing that, that I would say is missing and that you bring out quite nicely in your study is, is consumption, right? That um, usually we think of innovators, particularly scientists, uh, as producers, people who make a new instrument, who patent a new idea, make a new discovery. Um, but what you show is that also, in addition, in, in order to make that possible, um, scientists are, are good, are, are savvy consumers. Uh, they know where to buy things. They, they're smart about figuring out, you know, what do I need to buy from whom? Uh, how do I bargain to a price <laughs> that will actually work for me? I, this is something that I think science policy doesn't pay nearly enough attention to. STS really hasn't noticed this nearly as much as it should, but it, but it runs throughout your study. It's really very nicely on display there. So what can you say a little bit more about this, um, about the ways in which you saw this at work in, in this laboratory. I mean, thanks for noting this because I hadn't noted it myself in the way that you have just articulated. I just, I just found it and, and it appears in the writing in, in, a, in, in the broad section of the geography of the place. Uh, uh, so if you're talking of the space and the place, I suddenly realized, and, and 
I must admit that this uh, it comes through through my conversations and learnings from the scientists themselves. So uh, I realized uh, it, it was probably not articulated that way, but very quickly I realized that what was done, and this is about the local context, about the relevance of the, the of the place and the space, that certain things were possible. So you know, I, I keep thinking, Cyrus, that in in this laboratory and in in lots of say all over India. Uh, the the chore bazaar or the scrap markets are very important. So where actually waste in courts is available for reuse and resale. Now in in countries and and contexts and economies where the concept of the scrap is not there for reuse anymore, it's it's it's, a, it's, it's discarded and and disposed. It's it's made invisible. I don't know if you can actually go and buy certain kinds of secondhand recycled goods in large parts of the Western world today. So the fact that that geography, that that physical market exists, where a scientist can go and buy an old computer, or I can go and buy an old bicycle part, or or whatever, now that geography. Uh, so the idea that I articulated actually comes from the fact that okay, it might be there, but if me as creating something needs something, which is not there anyway, I don't have the money. Where do I go? I mean, I I need something to create what I'm going to create. And that could be ideas. Uh, that could be a bunch of scientists who will, whom I can spar with. But it also be a market, like you said, very nicely, a consumer of the materials that are required. So uh, it is something that emerged in that sense, and I didn't really pay as much attention to it in the kind of uh, theoretical sense that you have just mentioned. But it just seems very obvious that you can't do without all that. And uh, so, so here was this scientific enterprise that was consuming ideas, yeah. using ideas. And consuming materials, which they would have had to get whether they had money or not. So I think it, it, what what led to that articulation was the specificity of what was available in that context in that time, which uh, the scientific scientists were able to identify as possible resources, and also then mobilize uh, physically and and conceptually and in idea terms. Great. Well, um, we have a nice list of uh, questions. So, should we start? Um, yeah, so, seeing so. What, what the audience has contributed. Um, so, one here from actually, what do we mean when we say that technological jihad is legally gray? So can you say something about this liminality of it? So, uh, what I mean here, I, I mean more than technological jihad, I'm saying jihad itself, uh, and I would give the example of uh, of this this automobile. I mean. Uh, Actually, one of the projects I'm now doing out of my research grant in IIT Bombay is to study uh, these, uh, you know, these jury rig, these homemade automobiles that are kind of running right across Indian rural India. I mean, India thousands. I spent in December three days in a small town in West Bengal in Haldia, and uh, I, I can show images at some other point of time. An amazingly jury rig vehicle, scavenged, made out of scavenged parts from. Uh, motor pumps from uh, power tillers in agricultural fields, from second-hand engines, uh, you know, bots from second-hand markets in Calcutta. Actually, a vehicle that is completely illegal by the law. I mean, it's not registered. You don't have a number plate on that one. It runs and it sells at a, at a price of about three, three and a half lakh rupees, four lakh rupees, 400,000 rupees. They're actually getting directly new uh, importing new engines from China that are coming straight from the uh, ports and the airports into these workshops on the highways in, in rural Bengal for being fitted into automobiles that do not have registrations. So uh, what I'm basically saying is that uh, this idea of, of Jugard in a sense, uh, or, or products that are created out of Jugard, uh, and in this very specific case of the automobile, which is the kind of classic case of Jugard. Uh, it is, it's been kind of banned by the Supreme Court in a specific order. So uh, th that's what I mean when I say that uh, it is, but you know, there is a more nuanced kind of thing, if I might say so, is that uh, also two things, I mean, if I might quickly, one is what's interesting about Jugard is that it is noun and verb at the same time, or it can be noun and verb at the same time. It can be a process. It can also be a product. So the automobile that we are talking about in parts of northern India is called the Jugal. And it has different names made in different ways, but it has different names in different parts of the country. 
So I was told in parts of Bengal it is called the Vano, as a kind of response to the failure or the non-allowing of the Nano in. Uh, it's otherwise called the machine van or the machine, the motor van. Uh, motor, uh, yeah. So, but but the point is uh, that that's one one thing. So the process and the product. And the other thing is, you know, the, the liminality I've been wondering is that any innovation is a pushing at the boundaries of the existing frameworks. It could be technological boundaries, could be technical boundaries, could be policy boundaries, could be legal boundaries. And it is when the, 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 the success is actually in a very classical kind of uh, STS kind of way, it is a success that needs to be explained because why is it that one kind of innovation that pushes at boundaries gets legalized and the other, it changes the framework of law actually in many cases. And in others, uh, that same legal framework will not allow for that particular innovation or that particular uh, uh, intervention uh, to succeed. So uh, if you look at, there's a story I referred to from the 1960s in from Taiwan, where they have their own versions of these automobiles and they have multiple names for automobiles made in exactly the same ways. So the Jugad of India today was there in, in Taiwan in the 60s and 70s. It's a very interesting paper in the East, uh, the East Asian Journal of Science and Technology Studies, which I refer to, where uh, the, the author makes the claim that actually the, the automobile industry and the, uh, the corporate sector and the political system came together to, to delegitimize these automobiles because they were coming in the way of their private profit. So I think this can operate in multiple registers. The idea of the liminality, what I'm saying is about uh, in the specific context of the vehicle, but also the fact that is it the right process? Is it allowed? No, it, it, it may not be because otherwise one would not be able to innovate, one would go by. So pushing of the boundaries leads to a certain space that might be, might be, might be great. Yeah, if that answers, hopefully. Yeah, I think this is certainly an area where, yeah, social scientific ideas about things like who's an innovator or what counts as innovation, these are conditioned by, but also they then in turn condition yeah, legal framework, funding, absolutely among different uh, parts of society, and it, it, we need to be reflexive about um, yeah what we're saying as social scientists. Yep. Here's a question from uh, Janaki. I quite like it. Says um, scale is seen in many quarters as a metric for gauging the success of an innovation, especially for applied technologies. Uh, we, uh, so, sorry, uh, which one is this? I'm trying to. Yeah, from uh, Janaki Shunavas at uh, 126 p.m. Oh, uh, that's 126 at your place. Yeah, so scale is seen in many quarters as a metric for gauging the success of an innovation, especially for applied technologies. Yeah. Do you see attention between the importance of locality and context for a good innovation and the need for its scalability to other locations and contexts to, for it to be re recognized as successful. So there's a tension here right between um, the policymakers saying, oh, well, you need to commercialize your instrument and you need to sell it all over the world. That's what counts as success versus uh, someone like Dr. Dekai saying, well, you know, I want to serve my students. I want to serve my community. Uh, you know, I have a local role to play, which is just as important as uh, this uh, you know, scaling up uh, to a, a global reach. I, I will answer that. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer that, but it will be also interesting, Cyrus, uh, to, to hear what you think about that. So, you know, I think we have to ask the question about scale itself. I mean, why is scale so important? And, you know, I, I could be wrong, but scale, in a sense, the discussion on scale at the moment is a unidimensional scale. Uh, it is a uni unidimensional discussion in the sense it is about mass production. We are not mm -hmm. talking about any other significant paradigm or understanding of scale. Because if I might actually argue, Jugaad is hugely scaled because if we go by the principles of what Jugaad is, the processes by which you overcome resource constraints, and if you label that as Jugaad, all of us are actually indulging in that process. There's a huge scale over there. I mean, you know, the, the picture of the, the uh, there's an image of the first transistor uh, that if, if, if I might, uh, with your permission, uh, Cyrus, should I just show that I have a picture on the slide of that one? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a fascinating image to, to look at. Um, and I'll quickly do that. So 
Look at this. <laughs> yeah. This is, and, 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 the, and the text is, uh, I, I pick it up from the web. It's not so much to look at the overriding impression is of several mangled paper clips, clumsily soldered into some chunky scrap metal, but really the whole of modern digital life stems from it. Yeah. There's the first transistor as it was patented by three Nobel Prize winning Bell Laboratory scientists. Has this not scaled? I mean, so the idea of scale uh, is important. So I think one is we have to evaluate, we have to have different parameters of evaluating success and innovation. Scale might be one of them if scale is important. So, uh, you know, we have huge enterprises where uniqueness, uh, distinction is important, where scale doesn't matter because scale is about mass production, scale is about loss of identity. When you create something that has identity, when you create something that uh, does not want scale, then how can you evaluate by the, by the parameters of scale? So I think we have to negotiate with that discussion on the importance of scale uh, in the sense that it cannot be applied universally to all discourses. At the moment, there are these two or three frameworks that get applied. One is scale, one is commercial viability, one is financial sustainability. Yes, all important, but uh, maybe there is more because if we just went by that, a lot of scientific innovation and uh, research and, and technological and scientific innovation would not happen because uh, it was being evaluated by other parameters. And I mean, Cyrus, if you'd yeah. like to step in on that bit as well, please. Yeah, yeah, I have a few thoughts. So, I mean, there's a sense in which scale um, is a real thing and it, and it matters. So the transistor is probably the most mind boggling example of that we can think of. You know, in, in 1947, there was this one uh, transistor that you showed us and today, well, for the past um, almost 15 years, more transistors have been made than grains of rice per year and sold at lower unit costs, you know? I mean, so just this incredible expansion of scale and, and, and that matters. But there's another sense in which scale doesn't really exist, right? I mean, um, if we think of it in, in social terms, in terms of interaction, uh, you know, I think policymakers sometimes say, well, you know, if a scientist discovers something that then the scientific community embraces, the global scientific community embraces, that's scaling up, right? Um, but of course, the way in which that happens is, is also just through interpersonal interactions. Uh, you know, you go to a conference, you meet people, you present your ideas. That's, uh, there's no sense in which that's at a different scale than you, you know, teaching students in your local place and interacting with that local community. The, the, the scale is flat and we should uh, really value both kinds of interactions, right? We should say to scientists, well, yeah, you go to this international conference, you, you share your ideas there, that's important, but also you become an important person in your community. You really contribute something to that community. Um, you, uh, you know, help train the, the people in that community. That also is, is uh, something that we recognize and, and think has worth. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Ah, yeah, here's some. Um, Returning to you, Dad, so um, uh, there's a question here. There's a physical level of Jugad, a problem-solving workaround. Is there a conceptual level of Jugad as well, right? So can we can we speak of a theory of Jugad, uh, maybe? Uh, mm, uh, I I don't know. I mean, I, maybe that that's work to be done, and uh, I feel that uh, I think I also mentioned it earlier. Is that I, that's a very interesting space of work for Jugad at multiple levels, including, for instance, the etymology. Where does it come from? Um, my, my keen interest has been to also see uh, how does it appear, for instance, in the South, South Indian languages, in Malayalam, Kannada, Tamil, and, and, and Kannada, and the other uh, variants in, in South India. So uh, I don't know. I mean, this is a question I've been asked. Uh, is there a theory of Jugad as sort? But I, I don't have one at the moment. And... Uh, Maybe there are scholars here who could probably pick it up, and uh, I think more work to be done. And I and I hope we can do that because I think it has huge possibility and huge uh, relevance more than anything. I yeah, hope that yeah. that answers that's a satisfactory answer for <laughs> the person who's uh, asked. And if not, then my apologies. Yeah, I think um, 
the the slipperiness of any theory of Dugas, the, the, the inability our inability to put a finger on what a theory of Dugas would be. I think that's part of how Dugas gets this um, uh, ambiguous reputation, right? That um, scientific ideas that have a theory and you can point to the theory, uh, those very easily get valorized. Uh, but these, um, yeah, these more ad hoc scientific practices where the theory is harder to locate, those for whatever reason, I don't think for good reasons, uh, often don't get valorized uh, to the same extent. Hmm. And you know, I also feel, uh, you know, maybe there is other formulation that can be used for some of all this. I mean, there's nothing sacrosanct about uh, Jugard. There's nothing to say that this is this is it. This is the best. Yeah, yeah. It, it is available. It seems to perform some work. It has a prevalence in practice and in usage. Uh, and uh, uh, we just have to do justice to it and, and and discard it or accept it with a certain scientific rigor. That would that really is my my contention. I'm in no way defending uh, Jugard because the, I think the problem is that uh, we when anything goes wrong. It is very immediately dismissed as oh it, because of Jugard. So you know yeah. uh, the, the the big Rambaxi scandal that happened with uh, with an internal whistleblower actually pointing out to a lot of the malpractices in uh, in Rambaxi a few years ago, and that become a classical case. I forget the name of the whistleblower, but he wrote a, a when I was doing my PhD, he wrote a piece in the Hindu, an opinion piece, uh, telling the story and saying the Rambaxi scam happened because of India's Jugard and Chaltaha attitude. And my problem was, and I did respond, and uh, as a matter of fact, the Hindu did carry it, and then he also responded, is we just call it same simple fraud. I mean, wh wh what does Jugaad really bring to the table? Because uh, what do you mean by Jugaad to begin with? And this was simple fraud, and you, you just say it's fraud, and that's it. You don't need to bring in labels uh, unless they perform some work for you. And in my case, in this case, I couldn't use the word innovation because it didn't kind of talk to me uh, in the cultural context of what the lab was doing. And it seems to do some work. So I think we need a little more rigor uh, with how we are dealing with uh, Juba. Yeah. I, I would say this goes to this um, point about diversity that you emphasized in, in your talk today that um, uh, science can't function as a monoculture. Uh, so, you know, this theory driven science or commercial science, yeah, these have good, good features to them, but, but we can't say that science can only be like that. Science should also include practices like Jugad, but also we wouldn't ever want a science that's only <laughs> Jugad, that, uh, you know, we need a science that includes lots of different elements, lots of different approaches, lots of different uh, kinds of people. And in your experience, uh, Cyrus, would the scientists themselves uh, kind of agree with this kind of formulation? Because I think we are talking here as outsiders in that sense. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, what, what has been your experience? What has been uh, any conversations you've had, any insights you have on that? You know, I, I think it varies a lot. Um, people have different personalities. Some of them are uh, very proud of doing things very carefully and, and within a set of rules. And some of them take great pride in being inventive and in thinking of ways to get around uh, the rules or to get around various constraints. So certainly some of the people I, I interviewed, they were really proud that they had come up with these, um, yeah, seemingly not very scientific ways to do their science. Uh, so yeah. It depends who you talk to, but many, I think, are proud of this. Okay. Hmm. I, I think we're getting close to the end. Maybe one last question, and I think it's an invitation to you to um, kind of take us to the end of the story as well. So there's a question here. How is the country's funding for, nano, for science research and innovation reflected in the innovativeness of laboratories? For instance, did the use of refrigerators to cool microscopes and tires to minimize vibration diminish when there's been more funding for nanoscience? So that's a question that a little bit takes us to the point at which nano funding becomes available, but also in, in the case of your story, it's, it's the point at which uh, Dominikai's lab shuts down, right? And, and there is this um, semi-tragic ending uh, to your study. So can you say a little bit about that? 
it's interesting you say semi tragic <laughs> yeah no not uh, i i really wonder what uh, i mean the team of scientists who probably hear what what do they think about uh, for that but uh, you know uh, the very interesting thing about uh, policy and i just not had the time to discuss it here but i had it on the slides in the book in instrumental lives i talk of i do discuss two contemporary policy formulations of the indian context one is the science technology innovation policy of 2013 and the other is uh, just as i was finishing my phd was the uh, tech, uh, india technology vision 2035 that was released in 2016 now uh, in, in different spaces uh, i we me and other colleagues we've done a very detailed analysis and writing on on both of these and uh, you know my my perhaps too critical a comment on the policy is uh, and, and and it's there in the book and in the thesis the policy science technology innovation policy by the dst i don't see labs like this appearing anywhere in this policy i mean it's almost like two different planets and uh, i think uh, and technology vision 2035 on a completely different uh, kind of uh, uh, completely different register Uh, the way the technology vision which has been a technology vision for the country put together primarily by technocrat scientists and and bureaucrats is a very interesting and if i might say so very problematic visioning of india and its people yeah i have uh, we, we have a paper in in both current science and in epw and anybody who's interested could either check it out or write to me i could send it to them i'm happy to discuss it now what does this actually uh, offer science of this kind and it, it just seems completely disconnected in my opinion i i don't see uh, if a, if the policy is about the laboratory that i studied in my phd i don't see them there at all in the policy and i i'm not just talking of this laboratory the realities the nuts and bolts of what happens in these laboratories the challenges that scientists have to face the pressures that they have to face uh, their own aspirations and dreams their own ideas uh and not to say that, they, that it's missing but it, it is not there i mean I'm, i i really uh, feel i i struggle to find it there and to kind of close the circle i feel that studies of this kind and not because i did it but because we need more of these will actually influence and inform policy about the realities of the laboratory uh to make policy perhaps more relevant because in the indian context uh the issue of funding if the last point i might make in 2012 india actually launched a pretty unprecedented nano mission yeah where the uh, uh, through the dst the department of science and technology they really opened up their cupboards and and their and a thousand crores were made available for uh, research in nano science and technology which is i mean it's a pretty large number in the indian context yeah thousand crores but in and it was a five year allocation in 2017 when nano mission closed we now have a second version of that believe it or not 50% of that money was not used so you know so the complete and still there will be scientists and i i would argue very validly and genuinely say we do not have the resources so i think it is not just a matter of resources being made available of course there are institutional structures and there might be institutional issues of what happens with that 1000 crores and how and why but the but the black and white matter is that 500 crores was not used now so the, the question so it, there are two question there one is who thought that 1000 crores was going to be required how are we going to hold that policy maker accountable and on the other hand it also seems to indicate that the spaces where this money is supposed to be used the labs and the and the people and the institutions do not have that capacity now we also have to so it's, a, it's not going to solve the problem by just making more money available yeah do we have the capacity what are we going to do uh, i think are very very important questions so uh, what is policy about what is policy driven by i think are are huge black boxes we are not engaging in in india in the in the science and technology domain or in the science policy or in the humanities with these processes with these documents what are they saying why are they saying uh, and uh, some of it is actually quite problematic we require engagement i mean if i might wrap up that yeah. answer on that question yeah yeah becoming engaged is always over but I, i think you know what you've offered us is is an incredible example of where 
a very, very detailed micro study of, of just immersion in this one local environment has implications. Absolutely, it, it, absolutely. Say something at a much uh, uh, wider level. I think it's very underrated. This idea of, oh, it's one case study, you know, how is it generalizable? What is applicability? I think that that scientific, you know, generalization scale numbers, I think is doing a lot of injustice to the to the value of this kind of study. Kind yeah. of studies. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, sir. Very yeah. much. Uh, so I think we're at the, the end of um, the Q&A session, but uh, Venkat, I, I, I'd invite you back in and, and I think um, you're going to explain what happens next. Yeah, well, what happens next is I, I thank you both uh, for what has been actually a really fantastic discussion. This has worked out um, really, really, really well. And uh, I, I'm very grateful that you guys sort of step in at short, uh, short notice to uh, sort of engage in these conversations. Uh, we're going to open up the, Chandrakan, if you don't mind, if you could just open up the chat window for um, the rest of the attendees. If people just want to sort of bounce questions to Pankaj and Cyrus, who have kindly agreed to stay around. So again, if this was a physical talk, this is the moment when we'll all trudge out of the, the lecture hall and you know, sip our teas and everything else. And you know, I'll, I'll take a few unsuspecting people into the archives. Um, but since we're not doing that, we're just gonna try and open up the, the chat window and people can sort of you know, look at, continue to look at the questions in the Q and A and sort of, if you guys want to sort of take a shot at any, any of those, uh, that's, that's fine. But um, the, the session, Sorry, what was that, Chandrakan? Formally say bye bye to the live stream and the recording. Then yeah, so this is the moment when we stop doing the live stream and the recording. This is the moment when you guys can start speaking things that are more controversial if you'd like to. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, but I do want to thank both of you on behalf of the campus and uh, thanks to everyone who attended the talk. And we'll see you next month in probably in a forum similar to this one. So I, thanks I mean, again. Before we wrap up, if I might just, is to also, I mean, um, I take the liberty also on behalf of Cyrus to thank Venkat and the NCBS, the archives at the NCBS. I think it's been a fascinating uh, conversation. Uh, although we also had a little bit of a rerun or a kind of test a few couple of days ago, uh, it just opened up so many interesting ideas. Uh, and also to the people who've sent in their uh, questions in, in yeah. the Q&A, apologies that you know we've not been able to respond. Each one, I quickly looked at them. Each one is a fascinating question. Uh, thanks so much. I'm available on online and uh, uh, we can share a conversation. Cyrus, I'm sure, will be available. Uh, so we can take this uh, take this forward in different ways. I'm hoping this is just a beginning of, of interactions uh, along these lines of studying more laboratories, studying instruments, studying matter. So uh, apologies that we can't take all questions because that's never going to be possible. But thanks so much for everybody for attending because it's been a great learning exercise and an experience for me as well. So thank you, everybody. Awesome. So I'm Perfect. closing the live. Thanks so much, Andrew. Yeah. Thank you.